This is the 27th session of Look at the Book on Romans 8. Father, I ask that as Paul's crescendo begins, that you would do the same for our affections for yourself and for your great work that is being celebrated in the last part of this chapter. In Jesus' name, I ask for this gift. Amen. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What shall we say to these things? That would perhaps be all of, all of Romans 8, maybe the whole book, but especially 8, 28 to 30 that we have just seen. What shall we say to these magnificent works of God to secure our glorification? Isn't it interesting that even though he says, what shall we say the next verses are all questions. There are six of them. are questions. One is here. What then shall we say? Another one is here. Who can bring any charge against us? Another one is here. How will he not also give us all things? So he's, he wants us to, to say, why does he use rhetorical questions? And wouldn't the key be right here? When you ask a rhetorical question to someone, you, you, you insist that they be drawn in. You insist that they make the point, right? He, his point is implicit in the questions because there's no answers given and expects us to be able to give the answer. But he's saying, what shall we say? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you by asking rhetorical questions to join me in saying something about these. It's, it's like you spend 10 minutes telling your child that you, you love him and that you did this and this and this and ending by saying, now, wouldn't I give you good advice concerning this issue? And you don't want him to say, no, I, I don't think you're going to give good advice. I, I don't think that's a good argument that you just gave. And that's the way Paul is here. He has just spent his heart trying to help us respond in a certain way. He wants us to now render a verdict. God has rendered his verdict. What's yours going to be? What are you going to, to say? If God, here's the first question that we'll look at. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us. Who's this us? It's the ones who love God. Verse 28. It's the foreknown. It's the predestined. It's the called, the justified the glorified. It's the us of the preceding three verses. And God is for us in a way that he's not for everybody. This is crucial. John 3.16 shows that God is for the world. He's for the world. But he's not for the world and for the elect in the same way. John 3.16 says... For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. So whoever believes would have life, life everlasting. In other words, he, he loved the world. And the way he loved the world, the way he is for the world, is that he sent his Son and that son died for sins. And the message goes out to all the world. If you will believe, merely believe, trust him, you will have everlasting life. If you believe, you will find 
yourself loving God. You will find yourself foreknown. You will find yourself predestined. You will find yourself called. You will know yourself justified. You will know yourself glorified if you will believe. But for the elect, God goes beyond that offer of love and he establishes us. He foreknows us, predestines us, calls us, justifies us, and thus secures. So what's the answer here? Who can be against us? The answer is nobody. Nobody. That's what's expected. If God is for us, nobody can be against us, which causes us to say, well, Paul, did you just forget? Do you have a lapse of memory that you have been lashed 39 times, five times? That you have been beaten with rods three times? That you have been thrown in prison so many times you can't even remember you told us how many times it was? Did you just forget that? And of course he didn't forget it. What he means is, in the moment when somebody arrays themselves against us, puts a knife to our throat on a video because they are an Islamist terrorist group and says to our spouse, I'm cutting your husband's or your wife's head off in front of you if they don't renounce Christ and become a Muslim. At that moment, what you can say is they cannot succeed. Nobody can suck successfully, successfully be against me. If you cut my head off, you dispatch me to glory. I win, you lose. You cannot be successfully against me. That's the first question. A negation. That's negative. No one can succeed against us. Now positively, verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. New question. How will he not also with us gracious graciously give us all things. So two, two propositions, the second one a question. How do you restate this question? Like this, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all will surely, most definitely, give us all things with him. Give us also with him graciously give us all things. This is, this is a most definitely he will. So this is positive. This one was negative. No one can succeed. This one is positive right here. All things. Ours. And what's the argument for that? It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God can lift a stone that weighs a million pounds, he can lift a stone that weighs 10 pounds. And you can feel the weight of the stone here, right? He did not spare. There's pain in that. His own son, the infinitely precious one, but gave him up on the horrors of the cross. If God can do those three things, if he will not spare the infinitely precious second person of the Trinity and giving him over in his humanity, but give him up on the horrors of the cross, then it is a piece of cake. And that's not an overstatement. It is a piece of cake for God to give us all things with him. This was the hardest. This, I'm sorry, this is the easiest. But what does it mean? Is that prosperity gospel? You, you get everything you want. You get the car you want. You get the job you want. You get the spouse you want. You don't get cancer. No, we know that's not the case because down in verses 35 to 36, it says there's famine and nakedness and peril and sword. And in those things, we are conquerors. We are being counted as sheep to be slaughtered. We'd be killed all day long. This is not escape from the groanings of this creation. This is everything we need to be conformed to Christ. 
that is to do God's will. It's everything we need to make it to glory and enjoy God forever. So render your verdict. What shall we, John Piper and you who are watching this, what shall we say to these things? Will you say, no one can successfully be against me? All things are coming my way and everything will work for my good.